1945. Canadian tanks attack Germany's last line of defense west of the Rhine River. This was one of the heaviest battles on the Western Front during the Second World War. The Germans are outnumbered and desperate, determined to defend the fatherland at any cost. I'd rather take a few more enemies with me to the grave. That's what they were saying. They lure the Canadians into a trap, and the armored advance turns into a fight for survival. Every move that you make, they can see it, and it was just like shooting fish in a rainbow. At stake is nothing less than the fate of Germany, as these two forces fight for control of a patch of farmland, simply known as the Hochwald Gap. All you knew is that you had to kill them. farm country in western Germany. Today it's peaceful and serene, but in the winter of 1945 it's the scene of one of the most ferocious and costly battles of the Second World War. February 1945, the Second World War in Europe enters its final months. Allied armor rolls into the German Rhineland. And leading the attack is the 1st Canadian Army. Their objective is the Rhine River, and on the other side, central Germany. The Canadian mission is to hook up with British forces and push east, capturing bridges across the Rhine in the German town of Xanten. They've amassed a major strike force. 90,000 troops, 1,300 artillery pieces, over 1,000 tanks. Their armored workhorse is the Sherman 5 tank. This 32-ton version of the Sherman has a short-barreled 75-millimeter gun and only 51 millimeters of frontal armor. That means less firepower and protection, but more maneuverability. And the Allies are able to produce thousands of them. Well, the Sherman was a great little tank, and we had uh, far more of them than the opposition had. There was lots of them. That was one good thing. And the other thing was they were pretty rugged. They didn't require much maintenance. They were tough. The Sherman had a short barrel gun, so they could only damage us at a very close range. The Sherman. The Sherman wasn't as good as our Panther. He had a long cannon. They couldn't compare to the Panther. The Panther is armed with a high-velocity 75-millimeter gun and is protected by 80 millimeters of sloping frontal armor. And with a top speed of 40 kilometers per hour, the Panther is one of the best-designed tanks of World War II. But in the winter of 1945, it's numbers that count, and the Germans are at a disadvantage. The Allies had so much more equipment, so much better supply for gas, food, and ammunition. We couldn't compete with that, and by 1945, we barely had any tanks left. To defend the Rhineland, all the Germans are able to field are a handful of Panthers almost a dozen of the heavier Tigers, and less than 100 anti-tank guns. It's an enormous disparity in men and firepower. But the Germans have another weapon, sheer determination to stop the invasion of their homeland. Today, British and Canadian crossed the border to Germany. The Germans were defending their own country. Each of these soldiers thought not that he was fighting for Hitler or he was fighting for Hitler's regime, but he was fighting for his country, 
for his people at home. It's called the fatherland, you know, in, in their terminology. So you're, you're going to fight a hell of a lot harder than you would under normal circumstances. I was really amazed at the tenacity of them. It was just, just terrible, about it, right? the resistance that they were putting up. You knew that they were going to be killed. They knew they were going to be killed. And they, they, they fought all night anyway. For many of our men, their homes had been destroyed. Durch die Bombardierungen. And they told themselves, what am I supposed to do at home? I'd rather take a few more enemies with me to the grave. That's what they were saying. The Allied soldiers had to fight around every farm they saw, every little forest they saw, every little village they saw, they had to fight. Resistance is ferocious, and as the battle enters its second bloody week, the assault bogs down. In 18 days of fighting, the Allies lose over 8,000 men and hundreds of tanks, while advancing only 25 kilometers. Allied command sends in Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, commander of the 2nd Canadian Corps, to get things moving. He implements Operation Blockbuster, a bold plan for tanks and infantry to attack quickly and at night, seizing the high ground between the villages of Kalkar and Udom. This will clear the way for his main force to cross a valley and overwhelm German defenders dug in along the Hochwald Ridge, their last line of defense before the Rhine River. The Germans mute the terrain because it's their terrain. And so it wasn't so important that they only had 10% of the army of the Allied. It is very easy to hide soldiers in these forests. It's very easy to hold up every soldier who's coming, every tank who's coming. And this made it very difficult to take this ridge as a movement. But this is just the beginning of the Allies' problems. They also have to deal with the weather, and spring has come early to the Rhineland. Because of the melting ice, three of the rivers were carrying so much water. We also destroyed the dams. And there were two other rivers that were carrying so much water, there was no way for them to get through. And there was also a lot of mud. It flowed over all the roads, all the fences, and your maps became useless because all you could see was endless, endless mud. To the left and right of the roads, the ground had turned to swamp, so they had to stay on the roads. They couldn't use the fields. And there, they were easy targets for us. morning of February 26th, Canadian infantry, supported by nearly 80 tanks of the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade, launch phase one of Operation Blockbuster. Their mission is to take and hold the German-occupied Kalkar Ridge, clearing the way for the main attack against the Hochwald on the other side of the valley. It begins with an artillery barrage by 700 Allied guns. All those guns broke loose, just tremendous fire. The sound of the gunfire uh, and the tremendous volume of it as we were advancing our own gunfire, it was a sound that was so great you could, all, you could feel it on your body. This constant roar, even inside of the tank, you, you could feel the guns. They make a little more noise when you're in front of them than they do when you're behind them. It was raining 
very steadily. The ground was just terrible, absolutely terrible. We pressed into the minefields, and the first three tanks hit mines. The teller mine would blow your track off, and it would buckle the floor under, under the driver. And that basically disabled the tank. We reported that we'd hit the minefield, and the two IC came on the air and said, press on. And I can recall Butler said, how the hell do you press on when you're in a minefield? And this is in the dark. You really don't know what the hell you're doing. And we found sort of a little track or trail. And we turned right and went through the minefield on basically on a country lane. So the Germans hadn't mined it. The loader operator's job really is, like if you're not firing immediately, is to pivot your periscope. And as we progressed, I could see two German tanks off as they passed a burning barn. And I yelled into the mic, German tanks. They're Panthers, and they're easily able to outgun Hale's short-barreled Sherman. But we knew you can't do anything about it, particularly at a distance. But the Canadians have some additional firepower. Each troop of four tanks includes at least one Sherman Firefly armed with a long barrel, high velocity cannon. It's a tank buster, the so-called 17 pounder, able to penetrate 130 millimeters of armor at ranges of almost 1,000 meters. With the long barrel 17, you let him go in. You're not gonna bother using a 75 against the front view of a German Panther. first shot from the 17-pounder hits a barn, and the Panthers retreat in the smoke and confusion. Typical German tactics, you have the tanks in front, maybe, and as soon as the attack comes in, they fire and fire, and then they back away and draw you under their anti-tank guns. Despite the danger, Hale and his squadron push on to the ridge. We got to the top of the Kalkar Ridge itself, and then all of a sudden, wham! Daylight. John Hale and fellow tankers of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers went into the killing zone. If the Canadians fail to take Calcar Ridge, Operation Blockbuster and the Allies' big push to the Rhine will be over before it really begins. February 26, 1945. Operation Blockbuster is underway. And the fighting is furious from the very first shots. <laughs> Lieutenant General Guy Simmons sends scores of Sherman tanks into the thick of it. Their mission is to take and hold the heavily defended Kalkar Ridge, clearing the way for the main attack aimed at driving the Germans back across the Rhine River. But even though they're outnumbered, the Germans stubbornly stand their ground. We got to the top of the ridge, and then all of a sudden, wham, it was daylight, and the Germans were shooting. We fired on from our left flank and in front, and I can remember particularly this barn on our left flank. And the doors were coming open, yelling at the gunner, the doors, the doors are opening. What Hale has spotted is the infamous 88, Germany's most powerful anti-tank weapon. The 88s fire armor-piercing shells, able to penetrate almost 100 millimeters of steel at distances up to 1,500 meters. And the Canadians are well within range. I don't know about you or anyone else who has ever looked down the barrel of an 88. When it fires, you can actually see it coming at you. It's like a, a rolling ball 
like a fist coming. You can see the sparks coming off. Like it passed over our tank and cut off the aerial within a foot of the, the tank behind us. Then we instantly fired just as soon as he had fired at us. Looking behind us, the Grenadier Guard tank that was liaison, his tank got hit. There's an immediate fusion of the metal into a cherry red glow where it's, where it's hit with a black hole in the middle of it. And the crew commander was coming out the hatch and the ammunition exploded and he just sort of threw up his arms and then collapsed down into the turret. There were still six of us left on the top and we were all firing forward and to the left wing. And the Germans started cutting down the barn, the farmhouse structure. They were ripping it down and we were using it for cover. We were pulling out and shooting and so on. We couldn't withstand the, the amount of fire that was coming at us. We were going to get all get knocked out. The infantry had dug in and could defend their position. So we fired a, a smoke shell for five of the other tanks. One at a time, they pulled off the ridge as we blanked the left flank. By that time, the, the buildings were nearly gone and just burning rubble. And we decided to pull out. And the tank in the heavy mud, we put it in first gear and pulled ahead, but sort of snuffled under and stopped. And a German shell uh, fired right across in front of us. And then we started moving forward uh, again. And then finally there was another shot came at us. And Butler was in the turret and he was standing there and he just sort of fell on the floor on his ass and he said, oh. And it had a strange sound to it, you know, sort of. It didn't have the crack and it had a word. And I said, what happened to that? He said, you wouldn't believe it, but that was coming for us and it hit a hydro pole. We started out with a squadron and 19 tanks and one liaison tank, and we wound up with six. And that's my first introduction to the Rhineland battle. tanks join the attack, and the battle goes on into the next day. Finally, the outnumbered and outgunned Germans are forced to fall back, and the Canadians take Kalkar Ridge. With Kalkar Ridge secure, armor from the South Alberta Regiment moves forward for the main attack against the next ridge. It lies across a muddy valley, and will give this battle its name, Hochwald. General Simmons' plan is for infantry supported by the tanks of A Squadron to advance towards the village of Udum and seize the rail embankment, while B Squadron attacks across the valley into a long gap flanked on either side by thick woods. The aim is to force the Germans back to the village of Zanten on the Rhine River. It's a bold plan. It's off to a bad start. When the time came, we uh, moved out. I can still remember driving along, or slithering along, it's more like it. It took hours to go a mile. It was just unbelievable and very frustrating. They were up to the Sponson in mud. And so there we were, supposed to start at 11.30 at night, and we didn't get there till two, three, four o'clock in the morning because of getting stuck, running out of gas, so on. It 
it was almost daylight by the time they got it started. And you're going into the worst possible situation. You try not to have armor go through draws or files. And here is a wood on both sides loaded with firepower. And we're leading into this uh, absolute killing zone. To go into that gap the way we did, and it was just like shooting fish in a rain barrel. The Canadian tanks were plowing through deep mud. We laid our gun on the leading tank, and by the time we were ready to fire, it had already been hit. And we swung our gun to another, but that too stopped. The third tank at which we aimed fired first. And the shell burst only yards in front of us. Quickly, we realigned our gun. The tank seemed to falter, and we fired. We were just moving towards the position. And the incoming fire was such that you just could not exist there. To see these soldiers still trying to go forward and being uh, hit is soul destroying. While B Squadron takes a beating at the Hochwald Gap, a squadron advances towards the rail embankment, running through the village of Udham. It's the only piece of high ground in a sea of mud. It was what they called a right hook to go around Udham and try and establish uh, a front by the, the railway crossing. Supposedly the town was looked pretty vacant, but all the time you, you don't take that for granted. Anything that moved, we were shooting it up. The train was terrible. It was a, a real effort to get to our objective. Then on top of it, we had the traps. If you're if you fell into one of those, you were finished right there. And uh, here we were coming out onto a dike area, and unknown to us, on either side of the dike were big, deep ditches. The way those uh, tank ditches were designed, as you're coming around, you eventually lock on to one of those roads. That was a little piece of high ground from the mud. And so we probably chose to take that. And then when you get on it, then of course you can't get off it. And we just fell right in line. And that's the worst thing that could ever happen to an armored column. And they were just waiting for us. sitting ducks. The countryside near the German town of Udum shows little sign today of the ferocious battle that took place here. But during the final months of the Second World War, this quiet place was a battlefield. February 27th, 1945. Canadian Sherman tanks, avoiding minefields and mud, advance along a narrow dike, attempting to secure the railway embankment running through the town of Udo. We just fell right in line. And that's the worst thing that could ever happen to an armored column, is to have your tanks one behind the other. The Germans had placed a lot of tigers uh, 
uh, embedded down on the, in the ground area and anti-tank guns, and they were just waiting for us. Eddie, he was at the front, saw the tiger, and uh, I guess he knew that the tiger was drawing a bead on him. Eddie loaded up an AP, and he shot that out. According to him, he says the shell just bounced right off its hide. So he knew that he had to go to stage two, which was get that opening. The German Tiger is a 57-ton monster. It's built like a battleship, protected in places by more than 100 millimeters of steel plate. The Tiger seems indestructible, but it has a weak point, a narrow gap in its armor where the turret meets the hull. A shell strike there can put it out of action. to jam the tank, Tiger. But it does no good. The Canadians are caught in a trap. The Germans have prepared a perfect ambush. And it was just very fast. They just took out the front tank, they took out the back tank, they just took every other tank out. We were hit in the soft spot, like in the back. It was very abrupt. Um, deafening. Um, instant. Right off the bat, then, you jump into action. You, know, you got to get out. You know that, that that baby is burning. She's brewing up. We were fortunate to uh, manage to get out. Corporal McGivern looked and, and he saw the old girl was burning up pretty bad at the back end, so he says, we got to get out of here. And he looked over and he says, there's a farmhouse. He says, it's a short distance away. He says, we'll make a run for it. They reached the farmhouse only to be captured. Trooper Gardner and his tank crew spend the final months of the war in a prison camp. They're the lucky ones. In the first two days of battle, hundreds of Canadian soldiers die, and hundreds more are wounded. Grim proof of the fierce defense put up by the Germans. When you were there at the time, you didn't understand why they were fighting so, so hard. You didn't know why they were fighting. You didn't have time to understand what they were doing. All you knew is that they were fighting, and they weren't surrendering. Each of these soldiers believed that each day they could hold their position, would help their country, because it was so close to the industrial center of the German Reich. Most of the war industry was there. The army, had to come to the army was fighting to prevent any enemy from entering the Fatherland. That's why we were fighting so hard. On the morning of February 28, the Germans strike back at the Canadians' most vulnerable point, the Hochwald Gap. The Canadian tanks and infantry push into the gap and take ground near the western end. An advance force of Shermans moves forward to the midpoint in the gap. And the Germans pounce with Panther and Tiger tanks and self-propelled guns. Gunner David Marshall witnesses the attack. Over the rise in front of us came the snout of two tanks, a Tiger and a Panther, heading our way. When our gunners had them in our sights and before the German tanks could level out to bring their 88s down on us, our tanks opened fire with all guns blazing. We 
stop the attack, destroying the panther and forcing the tiger to retreat. The Germans strike again and again, and the Canadians struggle to hold their ground. But just when their situation seems desperate, help comes roaring in from the skies. The weather started to get better, and the fighter bombers came firing rockets. The typhoons were dangerous for us. The typhoons would range in above you, behind you somewhere, with 20 millimeter cannons. When they're converging on the target, then he lets go his rockets. And it's just a hell of a noise, and, and all you see is pieces. You didn't break a, a tiger or a panther, you break them in pieces. So they're very helpful. The typhoons, or tiffies as the tankers call them, stop the German advance with their rockets. But in battlefield chaos, anything can happen, as Canadian tanker Bill Luton recalls. The sound was heard overhead unlike anything I ever experienced in battle. Something like the noise of a high-speed train passing through a tunnel. I paused in wonderment, and then heard an explosion. looked up to see the Tiffy flaring away. Luton and his crew are under attack by the deadliest tank killer on the battlefield. One of their own Typhoon fighter bombers. The Battle of the Hawkwald Gap enters its third bloody day, and it's a standoff. The Germans won't back down, even though they're outnumbered and under attack by Allied warplanes. Rockets from Typhoon fighter bombers shred the Germans' dwindling supply of tanks. They were dangerous, these Typhoons, attacking every tank. The Typhoons swarm the Huckwald Gap, and in the chaos, one of them targets a Canadian tank. A sound was heard overhead unlike anything I ever experienced in battle. I paused in wonderment and then heard an explosion. There's nothing Bill Luton and his tank crew can do but release canisters of yellow smoke to identify themselves as friendly. Smoke blossomed gloriously on both sides of the tank and just in time. But no, he kept coming and go directly at us. I saw a great puff of smoke and instinctively ducked inside. A futile gesture against a rocket. Again came the sound of the express train in a tunnel, and again the explosion. We were still alive to hear it. The Tiffy had missed again. attack all morning, blunting the German attack. At noon, Canadian tanks push forward in another attempt to clear the Hochwald Gap. But again, they are stopped by German tanks and artillery. That night, tanks from the Canadian Grenadier Guards try again. But the Germans have perfect aiming points on either side of the gap. Tracer rounds light up the sky, and the guards are caught in a crossfire. By the time it's over, they have gained no ground and lost 10 tanks. We had the numbers of uh, troops, uh, weapons, and so on on our side. But a very well and ensconced enemy on the approaches can make you pay dearly, no matter uh, if you have the odds. Dawn, March 1st. The battle enters its fourth day, and the Canadians are still only halfway through the Hochwald Gap. German tanks and anti-tank guns in the woods on either side of the gap 
will have to be taken out one by one. That means attacking with tanks through the trees. Fighting through two forests is an absurdity, just an absolute absurdity. You should never do it. The biggest problem was the Panzerfaust, the, was the uh, one-shot rockets that they had. Panzerfaust means tank fist. It's small, highly portable, and lethal. It fires a 140 millimeter shaped charge at ranges of up to 60 meters and can penetrate 200 millimeters of armor, tearing a hole through the tank and unleashing a devastating explosion inside. He could hide in the wood. All he needed was an opening. He's got a big target. And once he hits that tank, there's a chance he sets off the ammunition in it or starts the tank on fire, or he has wounded at least one or a couple of the crew. I'll lock on a tank just like that, bingo. I don't think tanks are that useful, but that's what you had. We were going through with the Fusiliers Montreal into the forest in daytime. Four tanks were in line ahead, which is not very effective, instead of being spread out. The Major of the Fusiliers, Morial, wanted us to use HE against this group of Germans in a, in a clearing that was in front of us, which was our objective. The Sherman 5 carries two main types of ordnance armor-piercing shells for use against tanks, and HE, or high explosive rounds, for softer targets. You'd have to be careful and use the shock action more than the weapon. The ground shakes like an earthquake. But the Germans were protected. If you brought fire on them, they had overhead cover. And as soon as the shelling stopped, they're back into position, throw the sticks and what have you out of the way, and they're ready for business. The field artillery observation officer, he called in a crump of 25 pound pounders. And all of a sudden, they came in and they landed on that clearing. Just the most magnificent shooting. And they just plastered about 10 or 15 rounds right in front of us. The heavy artillery clears the Germans, and the battle continues for the next 36 hours with tanks and artillery making small gains against fierce German resistance. Then on the morning of March 4th, the battlefield is silent. During the night, the Germans have fallen back, leaving the Hochwald Gap for the Canadians. The Shermans advance, and their objective, the village of Xanten on the Rhine River, comes into view. This is where the Germans will make their last stand. For the exhausted and battered Canadians, the fighting is far from over. The Hochwald Gap. A remote patch of farmland in western Germany. In February 1945, this was the scene of one of Canada's most brutal and costly battles of the Second World War. After five days of fighting, the battle comes to a swift and surprising end. German forces retreat in the night, leaving the gap and the woods on either side to the Canadians. This is an art that the Germans have, and we should really basically learn by it, because they have a habit of putting on a tremendous show so that the last thing you can think of is their withdrawing. But that's what they do 
but they leave people in position who then are very aggressive with, with their weapons. And they left two tanks, two Panthers. One was giving the other uh, covering fire. One would sit there and poke at anybody who showed up on top of the hill. The other guy had turned around and was going like hell the other way. My buddy Ed was there, and Ed uh, looked at the situation because uh, he didn't he didn't put his tanks over the top. He kept them behind the, the crest, what they call a, sort of a turret down position because uh, they can kill you. They can put a shell in the front of a Sherman and it'll come out the back. And he can do it three miles away. And Ed uh, looked at the situation and figured out, well, maybe I can get these both if I do it right. So he uh, gave gunner control and the gunner will drop the breech on his gun and look through the gun uh, barrel and watch the gun crest clearance. And he gets his sight on the tank when he's got crest clearance and then he fires. The dangerous one was the one that was facing him because it has the heavier plate uh, in the front and it has uh, the gun in the front, which was, still could get him. In that first tank, he was backing up a long, a little narrow road with ditches on the side, and he accidentally backed the back corner over the ditch, and it tipped up the next plate. It was just a flat plate, not very thick. The 45-ton Panther has 80 millimeters of sloped frontal armor, making it almost impenetrable. But its underside is only 30 millimeters thick and very vulnerable. He could see what was happening and studied the thing, and he hit a right bang in the middle of this place. So he just went, kept firing. This thing brewed up, and I don't know if people get out or not. But the other one was going the other way. The gun was pointing away from him, and the back of a Panther tank is not thick. It's probably three inches. One round at the other on the other tank, and he ricocheted off the deck and took the commander's head off. Everybody hopped out of that one that could hop out, and that tank was left there. With that, the last remaining obstacle in the Hawkwald Gap is out of the way, and the Canadians push forward to the outskirts of Zanton, their final objective. This is where the Germans have set up their last line of defense. But it's just a matter of time before they are overwhelmed. Allied warplanes mount a series of heavy, destructive bombing raids. Every day, every night, there were bombings of the city. The city, which was before of that, never attacked, now was destroyed by about 85%. I remember the bombings very well. We had to go down to the cellar very often. We heard the alarm sometimes in the middle of the night, and we were really scared. It was terrible. We heard the ordnance rumbling and watched the planes dropping bombs. There was a lot of destruction, and there were dead horses lying all around. This was a terrible experience for us. On March 7th, a month after the fighting in the Rhineland began, and eight days after their costly attack through the Hochwald, Canadian Sherman tanks roll into Zanton. They capture the bridges over the Rhine and open the way for an all-out Allied advance into the German heartland. Germany will surrender in less than two months. This battle here in the Rhineland 
is one of the forgotten battles of World War II. It was the Canadian British Army who opened the gate to Berlin. In the end, the casualties on both sides are appalling. The Germans lose 40,000 killed and wounded. And for the Canadians, the fighting in the Rhineland, including the Battle of the Hochwald Gap, became their bloodiest campaign in the entire war. The, the Rhineland, in, in terms of casualties, uh, basically 5,300 dead and wounded in, shall we say, 30 days. Like, that surpasses D-Day, it surpasses the worst of the Scheldt. Strangely enough, there isn't a sense of elation. It's more, thank God, it's over. Because coming to mind is the people that have been lost, the price paid, and that this is not the end.